All right, class, let's think about what we've covered so far in the class. The very first chapter was on bonding, and we got into properties a little bit there. We talked about stiffness, melting point, thermal expansion. But then a lot of what we've covered since then has been describing the structure of materials. We talked about free energy and how that gives rise to when things form and how. We talked about phase diagrams, which are these maps for telling us which phases are of interest. Crystal structures, which describe those phases. Um, imperfections, when the structure gets broken up. But now, now we can take all that structure information and we can translate it over to properties, right? And the first two chapters we're going to cover uh, talking about properties, with an emphasis on properties, is mechanical properties of solids. And then we're going to talk about deformation mechanisms. And it's going to help to lay that groundwork because a lot of the interesting mechanical deformation and you know properties that we see are informed by aspects of the structure. Okay. So we, uh, in the real world as engineers, we need to test mechanical properties. We test it all the time. We test strength, we test hardness, ductility, stiffness, and all of those are done in different environments, right? Because different environments will drastically change the property outcomes, right? Therefore, we need to come up with a way where we all test things the same way. So engineers right here uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, will test them the same as in Florida, it's the same as in China or Australia. So how do we do that? One thing that people do is they rely on ASTM standards. What's really great about it is you can come here to ASTM and you can just type in pretty much whatever. Come up with any sort of test that you're after. For example, I typed in here electrochromic because one of the companies that I started uh, takes advantage of electrochromism where you apply a small voltage and you make something change its color. We do this for ski goggles and other things, right? And what we noticed is that we knew that everyone when they tested these, they wanted to figure out what the lifetime was. And so sure enough, the first thing that comes up is a standard specification for evaluating accelerated aging performance of electrochromic devices in sealed insulating glass units. What's great is you can take a look at this. You have to download it. Um, our university has access. You don't have to buy it, but the university does. But inside of here, it will tell you the exact, you know, what is it that it covers? How exactly do you do the different tests? It describes the apparatus, the type of tools you need, so that everybody tests things the exact same way, which is going to be really important because if we don't test things the same way, then we can't compare this person's material with this person's. We don't know what's the best steel or the best whatever else if we're not testing them the same way. So we rely on ASTM for that. Okay? All right. Let's talk about the different types of loads and forces that are available, right? We've got tension, compression, and shear. So what are these things? You're probably familiar with them. You've probably seen them before in physics or uh, your introductory courses. So we're going to go relatively quickly through it. The first thing is tension. Tension is when the load is applied perpendicular to the face of a material, right? So the face of your material, it's pictured like a can of beans, right? If I glue <clears throat> a wire to the bottom of the top and I pull on that wire, then I'm putting the can under tension, right? Right, here's that top surface and my force is being applied perpendicular to it and I'm stretching it. I'm elongating the material, right? It has some initial length, we'll call it Li actually. Sometimes they call it L0, but L initial is a little clearer, I think. And after we pull this can of beans, right, what it does is it actually gets a little bit taller and a little bit skinnier. I'm drawing this like really dramatically, <laughs> um, you know, over exaggerated. But technically, the radius, right, this initial radius, Ri, is different than your final radius, Rf, and the initial versus the final length has also changed, right? It's gotten longer, so L final is longer, right? Okay, then the exact opposite happens under compression. If I squeeze on this thing, right, if my forces are the other direction, we call those negative, the, we, the, the, the naming convention is to call that a negative force. If it's a negative force, this is now under compression, and so it's going to bulge outwards. And again, typically on a lot of materials, this is a really small thing. It's hard to see it with your eyes, but with sensitive calibrated tools, we can see these things bulging, getting longer. Um, we call those strain gauges, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. Now, both of those forces act normal to the face. What if we apply a force parallel to that top face, right? That's when you end up getting shear, right? So you can see it there in that drawing of a cube, right? We had this cube. Now, if you imagine taking like, like on my phone here, I can take my two hands and I can apply a force like this where there's a friction component which is moving it this direction and that direction on the bottom face. So that is normal, it's acting normal to the face, right? The, the forces are like this. I'm pulling it that way 
and I'm doing it that way on that back face. So overall, it's not going to deform in the same way as before. It's not just going to get squattier or taller, right, like it did with compression and strain, uh, compression and tension. But instead, it's going to deform like this. You're going to get that it's, I'm really exaggerating it here, but it's going to stop looking like um, a perfect cube, and it's going to start looking like this sort of parallelogram, right? And so you can take this angle, right, this angle that it's deformed, um, becomes an important measure of how much strain has been brought to pass by torsion, right, or by shear. Now, torsion is a special version of shear where essentially you do it with one end fixed, and so you're twisting your object, okay? All right, so tension, compression, shear, and torsion. Tension tests, let's talk about those first. So the probably the most common type of mechanical testing that's done in material science with the exception of maybe hardness. Tension test, you start out with what's called a dog bone. That's the terminology for it. Uh, it looked kind of like a dog bone. You can see in these pictures. It's wide, and then it comes down, and then it's wide. Right? So you would clamp on right here and right here with your machine, and you would pull that apart, right? You clamp onto it. Now, why on earth do you think it has this dog bone shape where it's wide, and then it gets narrow in the middle? Well, think about it. When you want these things, when you want to test a material, you want to test the intrinsic material itself. You don't want to test um, flaws. But what happens when you clamp onto a material, right? These clamps, like if I took these pliers, if I was grabbing the material, like this ruler, right? The ruler is not a dog bone shape. So if I clamped onto it right here, and I clamped onto it over here, and I start pulling on it, there's a decent chance that where it breaks is right where the teeth of this plier bite into the ruler, right? Those little teeth, um, they let me get a good grip on it, but they also are like essentially creating surface flaws. And we've already learned about surface flaws that they're especially dangerous to causing brittle fracture. So we don't want that. So instead what they do is they narrow it down in the center. Now, why should they do that? Well, think about what stress is. Stress is equal to force over area, right? The stress is equal to the force divided by the area, the cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area here is small compared to here. Therefore, this material does not have constant stress all the way through. It has a region of very high stress here and very low stress where it's being clamped. Therefore, even though you're clamping it and you're putting imperfections where you're clamping, it has a low stress there relative to the center. So it's still going to break somewhere in that high stress area in the middle, which is by design, right? And you can see that here. Here's an example of a polymeric material and a metal material. Both of those break in the in the middle of that dog bone region, right? All right? So technically, uh, we define stress, uh, the engineering stress, as F divided by A naught, right? A naught is your initial stress. We could also write AI, right? The initial stress. AI, A naught, same thing. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we define strain? Strain would be equal to L final minus L initial divided by L initial, okay? And again, sometimes they use LI instead of initial. It means instantaneous, meaning at any given moment, and L naught is L zero. You're going to see it both ways, so... Um, it, the right way to think of it is final minus initial divided by initial, right? That's your strain, okay? What would be the stress units? Um, well, you've got a force, which is in newtons, divided by an area, so meter squared. So the, the SI units would be newtons per meter squared, and we have a special name for that. That is a Pascal, right? So 10 to the 6th, 1 million newtons per meter squared is 1 mega pascal, right? And that is a really common unit. Uh, when you go out and get jobs in the real world, they might be using freedom units with PSIs and KSIs, but in this class, we're going to stick to uh, SI, right? So use mega pascals. What about strain? Strain has no units, right? It's a length minus a length, so that is just a length, divided by a length, so length over length, no units. Um, so instead, they'll often give it as a percent. They'll say it had 10% elongation, or they might say it had 10 ppm elongation. So ppm stands for parts per million. So instead of dividing it by 100, like you do with percent, right? Cent, like cientos en español, um, it'd be per million, parts per million. You divide it by 1 million, okay? Um, we've already said that compression tests, you change the sign. <clears throat> we define the force as being a negative force under compression. Otherwise, the math's the same, the equations are the same. Um, we don't do compression tests as often. We're more interested in tensile strength, usually. 
Um, but there are lots of instances where compressive st strength is important. With ceramics, for example, ceramics break about 10 to 15 times lower stress under tension than they do compression, which is why you never take <coughs> a ceramic dinner plate and really pull on it. But you can stack them, right? Because under compression, they're much stronger than tension. With shear and torsional forces, this is how we define the strain. It's a different equation now, right? The stress is the same as before. It's now a shear stress, so it's force divided by the area. But now the strain, gamma, is equal to the tangent of theta, where remember what theta was? That's this angle that gets produced. If you take the tangent of that theta, that gives you gamma, and gamma is our shear strain, okay? So we've got shear stress and shear strain, okay? And then, of course, you can have combinations of loadings possible in your material. Just because you've got some material, right? You've got this can of beans, and you're applying what you think is a perfectly tensile load to it. You're just pulling it straight up and down. You could imagine that within that material, there exists some plane, and on that plane, you now have your forces broken up into a tensile force and a shear force, right? Where some fraction of this, you could do the geometry and figure out what fraction of it is going parallel to that surface versus perpendicular. You can get tension as well as shear stresses occurring there. And this is the formula for that. We're going to come back to this next chapter when we get to deformation in single crystals. So we'll put a pin in that for now.